as you know, some of you, um, although I do see one or two new faces, this lecture series happening for the second time this year and delayed as it was by COVID is uh, part of a collaboration between Princeton University Press, whose European headquarters have since 2021 been in Oxford at 99 Banbury Road and in the person of Ben Tate. So between Princeton University Press and the Oxford Research Centre in the Humanities, Torch, of which I am uh, very happily the director. Torch is a hub for intellectual collaboration and cross-disciplinary research based in the humanities here at the University of Oxford. I'm the director of Torch, as I said. I'm also professor of French literature, which makes me enormously pleased and proud to welcome Professor William Marx from the Collège de France, where he is professor of comparative literatures with an S. And he will be today leading us through the last set of thoughts concerning libraries of the mind. Before I hand over to Professor Marx, a few words of introduction for the new folk here. William Marx is, uh, this is by no means the first of the visiting professorships that he's held. Indeed, he's held several across Europe and across the world, from Belgium to Berlin, across to the US by way of Japan and beyond. He's a member of the Academia Europea, and his work likewise crosses borders and boundaries as it addresses the status and value of literature from antiquity to the present day, and as you'll see, beyond world literature. His focus on any given day might be on Paul Valéry or T on T.S. Eliot, who he has written about and published on a great deal uh, and brought many new insights to English readers of his work or of their work rather. This is, was partly the subject of a conversation we had with uh, William and, and Jefferson at Torch a few days ago, where the whole uh, status of being a, a, a person of letters between cultures was addressed um, rather wonderfully for a while. William might also reimagine Greek tragedy. His latest book, um, The Tomb of Oedipus, Why Greek Tragedies Were Not Tragic, has just been translated into English um, and was out just this last month has a wonderful cover with one of the Sheldonian heads, or it looks like one of the Sheldonian heads, smiling rather than looking fierce. His own writing life and the questions that his boundary crossing work raises um, are then, have then also been woven into uh, these lectures uh, over the last week or so. He's off to London, I think tomorrow already to give some more lectures in London. Um, so this is our last chance to hear him and he'll speak as the title suggests on the World Library or Beyond World Literature. Over to you, William. Well, thank you so much, uh, Wes, for this, uh, as well, again, and all, as always, uh, very kind and nice introduction. And thank you for Princeton University Press and Torch in general for this invitation. I'm glad that uh, I'm, I mean, not glad, glad that, it, that it is the end, but glad that uh, you come in so so many uh, again for this uh, last lecture in the series about the libraries of the mind i mean in during this uh, stormy uh, week but uh, let us be i mean i mean let us be be, be taken by the storm of literature uh, now so i turn on the computer i i go to the google page I do a search and the whole world is at my fingertips. The world is for everybody at the touch of a keyboard. Google Books gives me access to all the world's literature and the same goes for archive.org, the Gutenberg project or a site whose name cannot be mentioned, it's, it's worse like Lord Voldemort, uh, the library. I'm, we are citizens of the world. I'm a cosmopolitan and technology is evolving around me to allow me to put this world citizenship into practice or, or at least I think so. Because the world that is emerging from internet is very, very different from this ideal. Partitioned worlds, social networks, 
Each person is sent back to his or her own little universe to face suppositions that are increasingly difficult to become aware of because algorithms do everything to reinforce those presuppositions. Actually, from time immemorial, frameworks have been imposed, making it possible to limit our field of vision and also, at the same time, to give meaning to what was in front of us. And among those unthought frames of thought, there is, fundamentally, before algorithms, uh, before social networks, there is fundamentally literature, the system of literature, or the notion of literature, as a constraint imposed to our experience of texts. So, may I start with an example? It so happens that for the last two years, I have been working on the editions of the lectures of poetics made by Paul Valéry at the Collège de France for eight years, uh, from uh, 1937 to 1945. So this edition is now, I mean, complete. Uh, completed. It will be published by Gallimard in January in two volumes, uh, 1,400 pages, actually. So it will be a real monument, I mean, a heavy one, actually, right, uh, at least. But while editing those lectures, I came across this anecdote told by Paul Valéry in January 1940. And here is the anecdote, as told by Valéry. There is the famous story of the emperor who had commissioned a lobster or a crab from a Japanese or Chinese painter, I don't remember. He asked the artist for this work and the artist told him, it is not ready yet. One day the emperor, after six months, went to the artist and said, my crab, where is it? And he saw nothing. The artist said, it is ready. Show it to me then. So the artist took his sheet of paper, his brush, and made a perfect crab. He had learned by heart how to make his work of art. And it's in, during the course of a reflection about work, both art and works of art. So I am a serious editor, or I try to be, and I tried to find the source of this anecdote. And it proved much more difficult than I thought. Actually, the story was to be found everywhere afterwards. It was to be found in the writings of many French poets in the 1960s. Jean Follin, André Dautel, Francis Ponge, Yves Bonnefoy in the 1970s. So poets seemed really to love this apologue. And for them, it seemed to say something about the state of internal transformation in which the poet must find himself in order must find, must find himself sorry in order to make poetry and i also found the story in 1960 in the revue philosophique a philosophical journal um, and it was an article about the concept of form both in sciences and in art but interestingly for the author of this article. It was not a crab that the painter had to paint, but a rooster. Okay. So it is really from the 1960s onwards that the story seemed, seemed to spread in France and in the West. And this is probably an effect of the Zen fashion there was at the time. And there is also a very well-known version of this story. This version came long after 1940. It was written by the Italian writer Italo Calvino and was published in his posthumous Six Mimos for the New Millennium. And Calvino attributed the story to Chuang Tzu, presented here not as a philosopher, but as a painter. 
Here it is. Among Chuang Tzu's many skills, he was an expert draftsman. The king asked him to draw a crab. Chuang Tzu replied that he needed five years, a country house, and twelve servants. Five years later, the drawing was still not begun. I need another five years, said Chuang Tzu. The king granted them. At the end of these ten years, Chuang Tzu took up his brush and, in an instant, with a single stroke, he drew a crab, the most perfect crab ever seen. So, actually, for me to find the origin of this anecdote, Calvino, this, this quote by Calvino, was of no use to me, because Chuang Tzu is known as a famous Chinese philosopher, not as a painter. And so Calvino's version seemed even farther away from the original than Valéry's versions, than Valéry's story. And actually, you have noticed the snowball effect in the telling of the story. I mean, now, now you have a villa, you have 12 servants, you have 10 years, so it's, I mean, there is an expansion of the, of the, of the story. And actually, most of the other occurrences of the anecdotes, of the anecdote in different languages, but especially in English, do not provide any additional information. Most often, they refer implicitly to Calvino, who is the most direct source uh, of this anecdote. And sometimes, in other earlier variants, as in the Journal Philosophique in 1960, sometimes it is about a rooster instead of a crab. Actually, the earliest version I, of the anecdote I found was also by a French poet. But it, it is a poet who is quite forgotten today. He's Paul Géraldi. Paul Géraldi, the author of Toi et moi, which was a huge collection of poetry, which was a huge popular success between the wars. But it fell into, he fell into oblivion in the second half of the 20th century. But Paul Géraldi was very popular uh, in the interwar period. Paul Géraldi told the story of the Chinese painter in a lecture in 1925. And here are his words. And you will find him probably quite clownish in his way of speaking, because he was a good lecturer and very uh, him acted. But first, a story, a very short story, that this idea of the writer's slowness has just brought back to my mind. It was told to me by a painter. He was delighted by it. It seemed to him to contain the meaning of all his art. It enchanted me too. Here it is. An emperor of China, oh, I don't know if you like me, but I love stories that start with an emperor of China. I know there is a, I mean, laughter was recorded, I mean, in the transcript of the, of the, of the lecture. So, an emperor of China wanted to have a crab in his bedroom. I mean, a representation of a crab, a crab conveyed by the brush of a pure artist. He called the greatest artist of his time and asked him to make him a crab. The artist went and sat on the seashore, looked at crabs passionately and tried to fix their attitudes, their attitudes on paper and sheets of sketches piled up in his room. After a year, the emperor called him back. And my crab? I am thinking about it, the artist replied. The crab, the crab is not ready yet. It needs a little more work. Finally, after three years, the emperor, a little impatient, called the artist again and said, And my crab at last. It is ready, the artist replied. But... What have you done with it? said the emperor. Why didn't you bring it? Then the artist asked for a sheet of paper and a brush. He quickly drew a few lines and, handing the sheet to the emperor, said, Here is your crab, he said. Alas, the time is past for an art so long and so fast, so small and so great so simple and so learned. Yet, 
it would suit our hurried age, which is overwhelmed by too many signs and too many words. Our own crabs are a long way from that crab, but it is this, this Chinese man that we dream of resembling. And a lot of applause from the, uh, from the audience. Okay, so obviously this is a little comedy that Paul Giraldi was telling in his, to his audience in 1925. He used this story to illustrate the problem of the modern world being too fast. And interestingly, he was well aware that stories that begin with an emperor of China belong to a fashionable genre of fable, the Chinese fables of the West, as it were, which are perhaps not authentic at all. Moreover, he is the only one to mention his source, but an unreliable source, a painter, a painter who told Giraldi the story of this Chinese painter. Actually, I have not yet found the Western textual reference from which this painter mentioned by Géraldi drew his inspiration. But maybe this painter mentioned by Géraldi was its himself a fiction, to, who, who knows. And I do not know the source from which other authors draw. But there is little chance in any case that Paul Géraldi could be the source for all of them, although he may have been Possibly, he may have been the source for Valéry. So, the question is, is this story a fake? Is it a Chinese fable invented for the circumstances? What is interesting in any case, it's the variation of the rooster I told you about, which sometimes replaces the crab. And actually, this variation points to the ultimate source of this painter's story. It is a source that is indeed Chinese, but which has nothing to do with painting. Maybe you have already recognized it, but the most likely ultimate source of this story, the earliest one in any case, is chapter 19 of the Chuangzi. Uh, and it's my colleague at the Collège de France, Anne Sheng, specialist of uh, Chinese literature and Chinese civilization, who, I mean, for, for, for her, it was obvious. So when, when, she, when, she saw the, when she saw the story and when I asked her. So here's the story in the Shuangzi. Ji Xingxi was training gamecocks for the king. After 10 days, the king asked if they were ready. Not yet, they're too hearty and rely on their nerve. Another 10 days, and the king asked again. Not yet, they still respond to noises and movements. Another 10 days, and the king asked again. Not yet, they still look around fiercely and are full of spirit. Another 10 days, and the king asked again. They're close enough. Another cock can crow, and they show no sign of change. Look at them from a distance, and you think they were made of wood. Their virtue is complete. It's complete. All their cocks won't dare face up to them, but will turn and run. And this chapter 19 of the Truancy also tells the story of other craftsmen, other technicians who have mastered their art a cicada hunter, a ferryman, a swimmer, a carpenter. And we also know the story of the cook or butcher named Ding. It is a famous one in chapter 3 of the Chuangzi. The butcher Ding knows how to cut, to cut up an ox perfectly and without difficulty after years of training. And there is in the Chuangzi always the same insistence on the time needed to acquire a skill that has become eventually second nature. But there is never in this chapter 
19 or 3, there is never an allusion to any painter at all. And the only mention of a painter in the Truancy is, is in chapter 21, and it has nothing to do at all with our story. So, it is clear, however, that the anecdote of the Gamecocks from the Truancy is the earliest source of the story told by Valéry in 1940 and by Paul Géraldi in 1925. We find there the same relationship between a king and a craftsman and a similar time structure. The king asks for a specific animal again and again. The craftsman is training and makes the king wait to the point of impatience. And eventually, the result of the training turns to be completely paradoxical. The best gamecock is a cock that does not fight, and the best painting, painting of a crab is made without any model of any crab. So, the fact that the Chuangxi is the earliest source of the story is then indisputable. But how and when did the transformation happen? I have not yet found the intermediate version between the Truancy and the two French authors. I can only imagine that it is a French text from the end of the 19th century by a lover of Far Eastern culture, perhaps Judith Gauthier, for instance. But I haven't found the precise reference. And perhaps here yes, some, somebody could help me. I, I, I hope so. Well, what interests me is this. How did the painter get into this story, which is primarily, which was primarily a story of cockfighting? No doubt, the breeding of fighting roosters seemed to some European commentator or translator to be less immediately meaningful to the modern Western reader than the story of a Chinese painter with his brush. It's so much more poetic. And this is how Chinese texts get, can become more Chinese. They get so orientalized and they become more oriental. And at the same time, the figure of the, paint, of the painter adds something to the story and reduces the scope of the original anecdote. For the characters of the Truancy are simple craftsmen. They are often people of little means, beggars, vagabonds, hermits. They live as close to nature as possible. They obey the laws and rhythms of the universe. And the anecdote about Gamecocks conveys also a strong political message. The craftsman shows how independent he is from the king, and he finally gives the king a lesson about war. The best war you could ever win is the war you do not even have to wage. But you have, you have nothing in, of this in Valéry's story. It is a story about art, and the painter is not a humble craftsman. He's an artist, an artist honored by the emperor. And so to go from the little people of the Chuangxi, from these marginalized people to an artist, uh, who is highly regarded by the emperor, is to say something about art, but about European art, about the elite, about recognized excellence. With Valéry's story, we are definitely in a Western world, which at the end of the 19th century or the beginning of the 20th century, with symbolism, for instance, a Western world which valued art, the artist, as a superior being. Whereas the Truancy says 
something quite different, and even almost the opposite. It is marginality, it is asociality, which makes a proximity with nature possible. So in the anecdotes of chapter 19 of the Chuangzi, it is mainly a question of satisfying primary needs, food essentially, and not, it is not about the luxury of painting. There is thus an almost complete betrayal of the message of the Chuangzi in the version given by Valéry and Paul Géraldi uh, too. What in Valéry is meant as a praise of the necessity of work, work that leads to artistic excellence, was first, actually, and foremost for the Chuangzi, what was foremost the idea of passive communion with nature, with the Tao, in order to become one with it. It was the idea of finding strength not in oneself, but in the relationship with the environment. In Valerie's story, the painter gets the, the highest honor and praise from the emperor. But in the Chuanxi, the craftsman dares to give the king a political lesson, a lesson about war, about war. And this is how a Taoist apologue, a political and philosophical apologue, became with Valéry and other European writers, became a mere illustration of a post-symbolist conception of art. And actually, we could continue this development on the meaning of uh, the Chuangzi, but I will leave it to a sinologist. The passage of this text to the West, its transformation, tells us something, however, about ourselves. It gives us a lesson in reading. It teaches us difficulty of reading distant texts. The paradox of this story, in fact, is that the real otherness, the real exoticism, is not found in the story about a Chinese painter with his brush, but in the anecdote about game cocks. But it is such a strong otherness that it was found capable of arousing, arousing incomprehension. So a more normal exoticism was substituted to the original story with a painter and a crab. Why the crab? Because the crab allowed the painter to be moved to, be moved to the shore of the sea in an environment that is more appealing to the Western reader than a farmyard with roosters. And Calvino adds even the villa and the servants and so on, all the luxuries. Exoticism is the acceptable, readable version of otherness. What if we defended the original otherness? But this requires much more effort. In truth, the story of the Chinese painter and the crab is exemplary of a certain relationship we have with the world through literary texts. It is a relationship that is established within a specific system called world literature, a system that allows for apparent, but only apparent, communication between all parts of the world. The German writer Goethe was one of the very first to use the terms world literature, Weltliteratur, in the 1830s, precisely in reference to a Chinese novel he had just read at the time. Europe's relationship with the Far East was thus at the very origin of the concept of world literature. But to understand how this system of world literature works, we have to go back to what the term literature means. 
beyond world literature. This is the subtitle I have chosen for this conference. And this subtitle is probably too ambitious. Well, going beyond world literature. Come on, let us not joke. Are we going to study literature beyond our planet, the literature of aliens? One day, one day perhaps, we will. But it is not yet a reality, and I'm not going to do here science fiction. Although, although it would be interesting um, to ask what an extraterrestrial literature might be. This, is, this would be a very interesting uh, theoretical question. And in fact, by the way, when there is theory, when there is philosophy, the hypothesis of aliens is always very useful. It allows us to place the problem in a more absolute light, I dare say, because it displaces the question from human contingencies. May I remind you that Leibniz and Immanuel Kant, who are not exactly jokers or jesters, brought the existence of aliens, of extraterrestrials, into their most serious reasoning on morality and on the justification of the existence of evil, a problem which is no small problem, actually. But back to the subtitle, Beyond World Literature. To tell the truth, I am playing with words in this title. When I say that we must go beyond world literature, the, loc the locution beyond does not refer to worlds but to literature. The phrase means that world literature is still too narrow a concept for us, but it is not the world that is too narrow, at least as long as we don't meet any aliens. It is in fact the concept of literature that is too narrow and that excessively restricts our vision without us necessarily realizing it. We need to go beyond the limitations imposed by the conceptions and practices of what we call literature. Actually, the name literature in its current usage has in fact only roughly two centuries of history behind it in European languages to designate the art that uses language as a material to designate, therefore, what we call precisely literature. And before that, other terms were used, poetry, belles lettres, for instance. But it is not just a question of terms. The object itself was different, and that explains why there was no need for a term to designate the set of texts that we group together today under the name of literature, precisely because this precise set of texts did not exist at the time. Texts were grouped differently, not the novel with poetry and drama as we do today. But for instance, as can be seen in old library catalogues, poetry was grouped with collections of medals and lapidary inscriptions. And this is an example we may remember uh, I developed in my first lecture. Now, such groupings are not insignificant. They have a meaning. They mean that the relationships between texts were not those we imagine today. They mean that other reading and writing practices existed, practices different from ours. In particular, the use of the world of the world literature has historically coincided with a new use of texts, both in reading and writing. We progressively moved from a social and collective consumption of texts within the frameworks of salons, for, for instance, 
or circles of personal sociability. We moved from that to an, to an individual consumption of literary works, to an intimate absorption of texts, each reader being alone with the text and maintaining a singular relationship with it, a relationship that could be described as free and autonomous because it was no longer controlled by a community of readers and consumers. In other words, each reader becomes relatively free to interpret texts in his or her own way according to his or her own needs and desires. And this freedom is all the easier to exercise when the personal link with the author of the text has become more tenuous. In the past, the text was produced within the framework of more or less extensive social circles which shared expectations and values. The text was the product of an, of an identifiable and locatable voice in the community. But in the 19th century, on the other hand, the diffusion of books in an industrial type of production, the availability of books everywhere, in railway station libraries, in reading rooms and in bookshops, and of course the lower cost of books, meant that the text was no longer linked to a singular enunciation by a singular person. The text which was accessed primarily through paper and no longer directly through the author's voice, therefore became an impersonal production. And it is easier to assimilate to one's own needs something that has been already freed by the book object itself, freed from its context of production. And another characteristic of literature also, in the narrow and historical sense of the term literature, was the cult of originality, the cult of the new, which was imposed against the repetition of models. Creative freedom became much greater. There were fewer social and aesthetic constraints on the author, and a competition was established where the criterion of originality became decisive. This competition coincided with the creation of what Pierre Bourdieu calls a field or a champ, that is, an autonomous space where writers themselves could define among themselves and with a minimum of external intervention the procedures, the, the procedures by which the value and legitimacy of their works are fixed. Privatization and intimacy of reading, freedom of interpretation, impersonalization of texts, autonomization of the literary field. These were the main characteristics of the new literary practices from the beginning of the 19th century. And there is a final characteristic, perfectly related to the notion of world literature. It is the increasing circulation of texts beyond their original context. And this circulation was all the more facilitated precisely because the practices of literary reading and interpretation, I mean the practices linked to the modern concept of literature, those practices valued the autonomy of interpretation and judgment by the individual reader. And the source of the text had itself become unidentifiable and impersonal. And thus, any text, even the oldest text, even the most remote, was able to become literature and to be integrated into the great world trade of literature. It was therefore no accident that the idea of world literature 
of Welt Literatur emerged in Goethe's time, just after the concept of literature itself had crystallized. As an autonomous, universally oriented art of language of a higher intellectuality, detached as far as possible from its context, literature became the great, the great decontextualizer, the phagocyte par excellence, ingesting all the scattered texts to make its own material. A literary reading, in fact, has the capacity of making sense of everything, of decontextualizing as much as possible, of seeing each text as an autonomous object and giving the reader interpretative power. This is the definition of literature. Everything can be read as literature. The... Je m'en charge. Sorry, yes, but uh, I do not... Need... Je m'en occupe. No, okay, good. <laughs> well, we, 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 we spied on this. <laughs> so always strange. So everything can be read as literature. The Mandingo epic of Sundiata in Africa, as well as Greek tragedy, the Tibetan bardo turtle, no less than Icelandic sagas. The notion of literature, the practices of literature, equalize all texts, just as capitalist market practices mean that everything can become a commodity. Everything can become a commodity and everything can become literature. Everything can be bought and everything can be read, can be interpreted and assimilated. There is even a rather astonishing vicious circle that feeds the literary system. It is that the further away a work is from its source, the more easily it is stripped of its historical function and stripped of its own power, and the, easy, and the easier it is to integrate the work into the vast literary corpus. In other words, a distant or ancient text about which nothing is known becomes literature all the more easily because there is no longer any authority to limit the reading that is made of it. And that's what happened with the story of the uh, Chinese uh, trainer of Gamecocks in the Chuanzi. And so the emergence of world literature, this global production and circulation of literature, which has now taken over the bookshops, taken over the media and the universities, thus this global production and circulation appears to be the ultimate stage in the process of literarization. That is, the process of the decontextualization and acculturation of works, if not their commodification and monetization, which were already highlighted, highlighted very early on by uh, Karl Marx and Friedrich uh, Engels, actually. They made that, uh, that comparison between world literature and uh, global market. And this is how we can see, for instance, the Tao Te King, Antigone, or the Arthurian novel integrate the great circuit of world literature and give rise to multiple interpretations and reinterpretations without limit, with innumerable contradictions in relation to the original intention of these works. And moreover, you know that in the modern conception of literature, the very notion of intention is considered an illusion. This is what William K. Wimsett famously called intentional fallacy, which prevents the use of any historical, biographical, or even contextual criterion during the process of interpretation. The new critics had painstakingly elaborated a complex system of internal assessment for the interpretation of any text, and this system was called close reading. 
And this system was in fact the upshot of the old philology, and in many ways, with its strict rules, close reading compensated for the death of the author, you know, the death of the author, as Roland Barthes uh, called it. And so close reading raised some limits to the freedom of readers. But now, however, it seems that readers have been let go completely, which is the ultimate logic of literature, the ultimate entailment of the system that emerged in the 19th century. The subjective and spontaneous emotion of the reader has now become the touchstone of the truth of any reading. If I feel upset by a text, this can never be, this can never be my fault, but the text. And because of the intentional fallacy principle, no historical or cultural contextualization of the text could ever prove I am wrong. When it comes to judging a text, I am and today's reader is always right. So, what can we do to go beyond world literature, as I propose? In no way should we stop the circulation of texts. On the contrary, it is important that the most numerous works continue to be read everywhere elsewhere than where they were produced, produced, and that they continue to fertilize the imagination. Cultures, all cultures, are made up of permanent reappropriations by readers and by creators. The permeability of cultures and the circulation of works are a fundamental fact of their history, even if we know the price of these transformations and betrayals sometimes. But fortunately, when it comes to immaterial and infinitely reproducible works such as texts, there is no crime of cultural appropriation. While the Parthenon friezes cannot be admired in both London and Athens, Homer and Sophocles can be read and studied in Oxford without frustrating any Greek library. The Bhagavad Gita can be analyzed here without harming any Brahmin. But these, these must be generous readings, creative readings, which are carried away by enthusiasm. When the reading becomes negative, when it takes on an inquisitorial dimension, then we must ask ourselves whether we are not trying to place the texts on the Procrustean bed of an overhanging and unifying gaze, which is precisely one of the problems posed by world literature. The problem of world literature is indeed that of the reader's overpowering ego, strong in his or her certainties when faced with texts that propose other visions of the world. When one does not have the keys to understanding, when does not have the knowledge of the context, misunderstanding threatens everywhere. A misunderstanding which can be of various kinds, cultural, religious, ideological, anthropological. And there is also the problem of the homogenization of a dominant point of view at world level, a point of view which favors a certain type of text, easily translatable to the detriment of others, to the detriment, in particular, of those texts which are the least translatable and which are also perhaps, for this fact, the most interesting because they are the most different from us. World literature should not be understood as a canon, that is, as a selection, but as a library, a world library, an almost infinite world library. And this world library is a library of the mind. I mean, it is something we must build inside ourselves. It is an attitude of the spirit. We must go beyond the limits of imposed by world literature to remove our blinkers 
and humbly enter the world library towards works that do not correspond to our way of life or our way of thinking. It is here that we must return, for instance, to the humble attitude of Saint Jerome, the translator of the Bible, when faced with a sacred text which embodied transcendence and therefore a complete otherness. This attitude is the philological attitude, which consists in documenting the text as much as possible in order to understand what they really meant in their original context. In a famous speech delivered at Harvard in 1837, called The American Scholar, the American philosopher Ralph Waldo Emerson proposed that each text should be subjected to an individual inquiry in order to match the divine soul, the divine soul that exists in each of us. Emerson's view was and is still quite influential, even implicitly in the current ways of reading. Well, in the system of the world library I am now proposing, I think we should do exactly the opposite. We should not first subject the text to ourselves, but subject ourselves, at least temporarily, to the mystery of each text we are confronted with. And this could also be defined as the anthropological ambition, which consists in not considering the works as words of universal value belonging to a world canon, but in grasping works as the localized expression of a possible humanity, of a particular social, political, moral or religious worldview. And it also means seeing in texts powers that exceed those we usually reserve for literature. For instance, when I used to teach Japanese no theater to my students, I first explained, I explained in detail the conditions in which these performances are given. I described the actors, I described the masks, the sets, the music, and we read the text of the plays. And this presentation of No lasted several sessions. The students then knew theoretically, theoretically what No is. They had all the information needed. Then, only then, I finally showed the video of a No performance. And there, systematically, it was a shock. The French or the Western students may have been warned, they may have known everything theoretically about no, but they were stunned, literally stunned, at the sight of the show. They had never seen anything like that. It's as if they were seeing theater produced by aliens. Well, this shock is beneficial. It is even salutary for our minds because it shakes us up. It shifts our focus. And it is the same shock that the poet Rainer Maria Rilke felt one day in 1908 during a visit to the Louvre Museum when he was dazzled by an archaic torso of a Poland going to read it first in German, perhaps to, to make another language uh, ring here in this hall. We kannten nicht sein unerhörtes Haupt, darin die Augen Äpfel heiften, aber sein Torso glüht noch wie ein Kandelaber, in dem sein Schauen nur zurückgeschraubt sich hält und glänzt. Sonst könnte nicht, sonst könnte nicht der Buch der Brust dich blenden und im leisen Drehen der Lenden könnte nicht ein Lächeln gehen zu jener Mitte, die die Zeugung 
trug. Sonst stünde dieser Stein entstellt und kurz unter der Schultern durchsichtigem Sturz und flimmerte nicht so wie Raubtierfälle und breche nicht aus allen seinen Rändern aus wie ein Stern, denn da ist keine Stelle, die dich nicht sieht. Du musst dein Leben ändern. We cannot know his legendary head with eyes like ripening fruit, and yet his torso is still suffused with brilliance from inside like a lamp in which his gaze now turned to low, gleams in all its power. Otherwise, the curved breast could not dazzle you so, nor could a smile run through the placid hips and thighs to that dark center where procreation flared. Otherwise, this stone would seem defaced beneath the translucent cascade of the shoulders and would not glisten like a wild beast's fur, would not from all the borders of itself burst like a star. For here there is no place that does not see you. You must change your life. You must change your life. Du musst dein Leben ändern. The ultimate injunction addressed to the poet by the statue is also valid for each of us, each of us, in front of any ancient or distant text, if we ever know how to adapt our gaze. We think we are observing a statue. It is actually observing us. We think we are reading texts, but we are no less read by them. We are judged, tested, shaken, sometimes revolted by them, subjected as we are to their stellar radiation. You must change your life, and you must also change your way of thinking, at least temporarily. You must enter into other customs, other uses, other ways of speaking, sometimes masked by deceptive similarities. Each text encloses an experience, each text confronts an otherness. But this otherness is not given as such. It has, to be it has to be conquered and understood through hard struggle. Today, with the ideological reform movements that are sweeping across our campuses and society as a whole, there is a huge tempta temptation to measure the content of texts by our own expectations, our scruples, our prohibitions. Immense is the temptation to look away from what is shocking when it is not about censoring it at all. And the intention is laudable in itself, but is to develop a superior moral conscience. But are we so sure of this superiority? What if we were to reverse the point of view? What if we let ourselves be destabilized by radically different values? What if, instead of judging, we allowed ourselves to be judged and transformed? Wouldn't it be strange to praise otherness in general and not accept the radical otherness of a different civilization with strange gods and idols. Is it not important for us to know humanity in all its diversity? It is not necessarily a question of approving. It's not a question of, of adhering. It's just of consenting for a moment to the mystery or to the scandal. It is just a matter of being silent of silencing one's own repulsions, one's own indignities. And such was John Keats's shock at a Grecian urn in his famous ode. What men or gods are these? 
what maidens loathe, what mad pursuit, what struggle to escape, what pipes and timbrels, what wild ecstasy. Thou, silent form, dost tease us out of thought as doth eternity, called pastoral. The mystery of the ancient, the mystery of the, of the distant work, the very scandal of the ancient or distant work, for this vase, this vase is about rape, says Keats. It's about rape, it's about murder, it's about ritual crimes. The mystery of the ancient or distant work, all this introduces a shattering otherness, which transforms the spectator or the reader. And what I find very beautiful in the testimony of Rilke and Keats is that their approach, which was originally purely aesthetic, that is, in line with the modern conception of literature, their approach succeeded, despite everything, in leading them to the threshold of mystery, to the moving revelation of otherness. Then, then, philological, historical, and anthropological work may lift a corner of the veil of this mystery, but the essential has already been accomplished, namely a modesty, a humility before the work, which results in transforming the spectator and reader, and sometimes even reduces him to silence. And this, in any case, has, has the advantage of preserving intact the strange, disquieting, destabilizing force that emanates from the work. So there is, therefore, even in the great Western aesthetic tradition of literature, there is a path, there is a path that allows us to go towards otherness and to refuse the complete acculturation of the work to our needs. This is the path that Paul Valéry also formulated in the 1930s when he wrote that certain words, namely poetry, urge us to become much more than they, much more than they urge us to understand. Mes excuses. Je rencontre quelques problèmes de connexion. Veuillez ré... Of course you, are, you, are, you have some problem of connection because nobody has connection here in this hall. <laughs> and, OK, ces paroles nous intiment de devenir bien plus qu'elles nous excitent à comprendre. These words urge us to become much more than they urge us to understand. Or, on the 13th January uh, 1945, when Paul Valéry declared from his chair of poetics at the Collège de France, a work of art is the transformation of something in order to transform someone. Une œuvre consiste à transformer quelque chose pour transformer quelqu'un. It is the same injunction to allow oneself to be transformed that Rilke felt before the archaic torso of Apollo. And it is also what Roland Barthes defined as the pleasure of the text, the plaisir du texte. That is to say, in the very strong and sexual sense of the term pleasure, an ecstasy that shakes the whole being and does not leave it intact, but on the contrary, trembling. So this will be actually my very short conclusion. Going beyond world literature means allowing oneself to be penetrated by a disturbing otherness, by a transcendence that escapes our immediate expectations, that escapes our conception of literature. And what I have tried to do here, in short, is to confront the Western tradition of literature, uh, the tradition of aesthetic reading, of appropriative reading, with another type of approach to text that preserves their otherness, what we might call a scientific, philological or anthropological reading which precisely allows us to go beyond the purely aesthetic approach. But what I have finally tried to show through the examples of Keats, of Rilke, Valéry, or Barthes, is that 
even within the Western literary tradition, there exists the possibility of a destabilizing aesthetic experience, an experience of otherness through the subversive force of formal emotion. And I believe that these two types of readings can thereby communicate and that aesthetic emotion can prepare for anthropological humility and vice versa. And in so doing, we would be able to build